Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome uh, to the first Garden Coach. And um, I'm Jennifer Brennan. I am the Garden Coach here at Chalet. And um, and oh, my light weird. My light's weird. Let me just let me try turning this off. Oh, that's better. That's better. I don't look like um, I don't look like this is better. This is good. Okay, and let's see. We've got two participants. So it's me and somebody else. Welcome, welcome. Um, what I do is um, I'm going to give the presentation and then um, answer the questions um, at the end. So uh, I've got all kinds of fun stuff to show you. Things from my own garden, new things coming into chalet, the chores you should be doing now. And um, so it's really fun to kick off the season with this. And even though we had snow again, um, you know, and, and, and I, I love how mother nature is, she's teasing us this year, you know, a little warm day, you know, a, you know, a little a cooler day, then a bunch of snow and then, you know, warm up again, melt all the snow and then a little, a little snow. Um, so she, she's teasing us, isn't she? So, uh, so I don't mind. I, I don't mind. It's just nice. It's nice. Uh, I'm 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 happy for what we can be happy about. Not having to wear masks if you don't need to wear a mask. And um, you know, it, we're we're moving forward. Moving forward. There's three people. Welcome aboard. Um, you've got um, um, the link to get onto the webinar it comes from Cal Calendly or Calendly, I say it both ways. And then you'll also get a link to the, um, the outline of the, um, of the presentation. So, you know, look for that. It doesn't come from Carly Thalman anymore. It's coming from uh, the, the, the Calendly or Calendly um, link, okay? So, um, so, okay, I'm watching, watching here. We have four people, welcome aboard. I'm Jennifer Brennan. I'm the horticulture information specialist here at Chalet. And as of next month, oh, what is this? Antivirus popping up here. As of next month, I will be at Chalet uh, for 31 years. Gosh, isn't that, isn't that scary to say out loud? Um, it's scary to say out loud. So, um, so, so yes, I do hair color. <laughs> And I have uh, 11 great aunts who would arise from their graves and haunt me at night, every night, if I stopped doing my hair color, uh, because they're all from down south. And man, you just, you didn't stop doing all those things because they just would, you would, it would just look like you'd just given up on yourself. <laughs> so I think I'm glad that I was raised down south. Sometimes I wonder. Um, but um, it's so fun that I've ended up up here in the Chicago area for all these years. So um, here we go. We have um, three minutes to go and um, four attendees besides me on, on, on the Zoom webinar. And um, what's interesting is, um, you know, how we've, we've all um, learned how to live in love uh, uh, with the Zoom. You know, it's almost like, it's almost like getting along with a, a you know a married partner. You know there are times you hate it, times you love it, times you really have, realize how necessary it is, and and uh, you know it, it's all of the above. So I, I'm I'm glad I've learned. I I I'm, I'm will be able to write a book about my experiences with Zoom, but I think we all will. Okay, I'm looking again. Seven people now, six six attendees, and um, and and me. Welcome aboard, welcome to the Chalet um, Garden Coach, where we decided to do this uh, two times a month going forward. And, um, you know, and the goal, my goal, my goal is to point out things that you'll be seeing in the next two weeks between this Garden Coach and next Garden Coach, things that you should be doing in your garden, um, warnings, warnings, warnings about, you know, problems that we're seeing or um, weeds, insects, diseases, or pests that I'm hearing about 
at the diagnostic desk here in, in the garden center. Oh, I can do a couple more public service announcements right now. Um, starting today, um, this is our Step Into Spring Customer Rewards Program. And until the 27th of March, um, every time you come in as a Chalet Rewards customer, and it's free to join if you're not a, a Chalet Rewards customer, you get 20% off your purchases of things in the gardens essentials area. So those are mulches, uh, fertilizer, seeds, bulbs, uh, all the tools, uh, uh, all those, all those, all those things. Also, anything in home decor, it's 20% off every purchase. So what a way to start your season or dress up your home for, for St. Patrick's Day and Easter. We've got so much fun things and, and we're getting all kinds of new things every day. I mean, every day. The supply chain is broken open and we're getting shipments and uh, we redid our uh, receiving department and our, our fulfillment department. So man, things are really coming through quick and fast and easy. So. So uh, let me check again. We have 17 people. It is 9.59 on this screen. Ooh, it just flipped to 10. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share the screen. Um, oh, and um, for your questions and answers, please put them in the Q&A section rather than the chat. It makes it easier for me to keep track of them at the end of the presentation so I can make sure I answer all of them, OK? And then I'm gonna go ahead and get the, uh, my PowerPoint up. Here we go, sharing the screen. All right, and we're gonna go to the slideshow from the beginning. Oh, this is almost too scary. There's two of me here. <laughs> so mm, I need to put my lipstick on on that one up on the top, but, but here we go. Uh, let me just see how many people we have again. Oh, we've got 28. Bravo, bravo. Welcome to the, the Garden Coach 2022. And um, I was kind of in making public service announcements uh, before everybody signed on. And um, starting today is our Step Into Spring Chalet Rewards Program. So for everyone who is a Chalet Rewards member, and it's free to join. So if you're not a member, come in, we'll get you signed up. And from today, the 11th through the 27th, so over two weeks, um, it, it, it goes to the, the 27th, which is a Sunday, you get 20% off every purchase that's in the Garden Essentials Department and, and the, the Home uh, Decor Department. So uh, what a great way to start your, you know, start your season. Um, so, and then the garden coach, we've decided to do, um, we have decided to do, oh, I just realized I need to mute my phone. So I'm seeing, I'm getting, I'm hearing sounds coming from it. So I just muted my phone and um, um, we're doing the garden coach every two weeks to um, alert you to chores you should be doing um, weeds, insects, diseases, and, um, and, and pests you should be aware of that will be coming your way in the next two weeks. And then uh, new products that we're going to be getting in uh, if you're looking for special fun things like hellebores are coming in on Monday. So, um, so, so, so we'll be doing the garden coach you know, every two weeks instead of once a week. So, um, so watch your emails for, for those notices. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and I think I'm in the right screen here. Oh, here it goes. Okay, I wanted to encourage you, even though there was snow everywhere, um, starting last night and this morning, um, these are the snowdrops in my yard. And I was walking around in my garden at uh, the beginning of the week and realized oh, when the snow all melted and I realized, oh my gosh, look at my snowdrops. Now, this is, this is a giant form that I got from a good friend who is one of those snowdrop um, collectors. And it, it, this came from Charles Cresson, who was, he and I were interns, summer interns 
at Longwood Gardens, and I'll never tell you how many years ago it was. <laughs> but we've kept in touch, and he gave these to me when I first moved him to my house. Oh gosh, I'm really going to give my age away now. No, I, I've been in my house for 35 years uh, in in Skokie, Evanston, and so it was just so fun to see the snowdrops. They usually come up but underneath the snow, and these did this year. Okay, this this. We're not seeing a lot of these yet, but this is a bouquet of ice folly uh, daffodils or narcissus. And these were from my home in uh, Northwest Arkansas. And it's a town called Bella Vista. Uh, it was my dad's home, my mom and dad's home. They built the home um, um, 20 years ago. And I planted these ice folly daffodils uh, 18 years ago in their garden. And my two sisters live in the house now, and um, and and I I uh, was able to um, buy it out of a reverse mortgage after my dad died, and so I love these were just picked this morning, and my sister sent me this photo. Isn't it fun to see these? And these will be coming up around here in the next two weeks. Okay, now this is, and you don't have this on your handout because this just came in right at the, the end of business yesterday, I found out that we're getting this shipment of hellebores on Monday. They'll most likely be on the front patio on benches and racks because the outdoor nursery isn't open yet. And we're planning on not having it open to the public because there's a lot of construction that has to be done setting the benches up um, for all the plants coming in. Um, our target is to have it open the first week of April. But until then, all these gorgeous plants are going to be on the front patio and you know so just and I, I just put a couple of the photos on here Anna's red is the one at the top this is uh, this is apricot blush is the one right in the in in the middle and then I love this other this other one this is called uh, double purple mystique it's the lower picture but I have to tell you um, that hellebores have just been the top, top plant perennial for adding to the, your garden. And ever since the ivory prince, and I should have put a picture of ivory prince on here, it was hybridized and released. I think it's been eight years now that ivory prince was, was, was introduced. And ivory prince was just, you know, just a, a, a whole game changer for hellebores. It was hybridized and selected so that the flower was held upright and facing you instead of hanging down. Most hellebores, the, the natives hang down. So because the plants open up the flowers so early in the spring that all of their sexual parts are exposed to mother nature. And so we'd have a really bad snow, then you know it could damage them. And, um, but we loved them and lived with them anyway because it's such a great perennial early blooming, you know, like, you know, in February and March across the nation and um, evergreen foliage, nobody eats it. The deer don't touch it and the rabbits don't touch it. So it is just a wonderful, it's just a wonderful, wonderful plant. And then with all these, all this hybrid, hybridization that's going on, you're just gonna see phenomenal, phen phenomenal colors and styles, doubles, singles, it, they're, they're gonna be great. So this was the breaking news, you know, of, of, of the week that the hellebores are arriving at Chalet. They'll be on the front patio on Monday. Now, the other thing that is re really fun is, is that not today, but they're, they're working on it today and it, it will be ready and set up uh, on of the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and, you know, and, and Monday, all of our summer flowering bulbs are going to be put out on the shelf inside the garden center. And the, all of the phenomenal dahlias, all of the elephant ears, the alocasia and, and, and the calocasia, um, the begonias, tuberous begonias, the caladiums, um, um, you know, oh, I had two pictures of the, 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 the different varieties of dahlias, different irises, lilies. We're going to have all the different lilies and the cannas. And the fun thing is you can start these bulbs in containers inside this month 
And when you start them, you know, on the 15th of March, that's, that's two months, eight weeks before the frost free date. And then you actually will have rooted bulbs and shoots of plants ready to be transplanted out into the garden on the frost free date. And it puts you ahead of the game on all of these plants by two months. So this is the time to, to buy them because of the selection and then get them started early if you can. And, um, you know, I, I like to, I like to, I, I don't like to use anything smaller than an eight inch pot and, you know, to, to get them started. But um, this is, these are, these are going to be fun, fun, fun. Now, March is the month for pruning. So this is the best time to, to prune all the woody plants, the trees and shrubs. They're the easiest to prune now because you can see the structure of the, of the woody parts because there are, no, there are no leaves on the plants. Now, deciduous plants um, are, are the best ones to prune now. Uh, it's a little early for evergreens. Unless you have wayward branches, you can go ahead and prune, and prune the evergreens. But it's much better to do um, ever, evergreens in early summer. And the most important thing is to always use a quality pruning tool. You wanna to have a bypass pruning share. And that means that the blades, uh, the, the blades bypass each other. And I'll have a photo in a minute. Now you always wanna go, you always wanna approach a plant with a reason to prune. You don't just go out and say, I'm gonna prune because that's my hobby. So you wanna have a purpose to prune. And so that means you, you prune them when you're just planting them or transplanting them to adjust the, you know, the, the, the top foliage, the top woody parts to how the roots, if the roots have been dug up, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna adjust that ratio. Uh, it's also a reason to prune is to train them. Like this is foliate apple. I think this is an apple. No, it's a pear, excuse me. This is foliate, you're training it. Another good reason is to control the size the appearance and the health. And then you also wanna control the production of fruit and flowers. So you can prune so that you will get more um, flowering parts and hence more fruit. You also wanna to prune to rejuvenate and you wanna to prune to create a barrier. Like if you're gonna, you're gonna have an evergreen as a shrub, you know, you, that, that, that's how you create the barrier. Now it's really important, pardon me, <coughs> that you understand the anatomy of trees and shrubs before you start pruning, because you have to understand, you know, what we're saying, what we're telling you to prune. So on, on, a, on the tree, you have your main trunk, and then the leader of the main trunk is, is the stalk that goes straight up. That's called the leader, and that's usually the tallest part of the, of, of the tree. And then laterals are the side branches. And so you have the laterals that come out, um, a, a term that, that I learned, you know, in, in my woody plant um, instructions at col in college at the University of Illinois is you want to have radial laterals on trees. So my instructor, Dr. Michael Durr, would teach us students to lay down on the ground with our head, you know, right up next to the trunk and look up the tree. And then if, if the, the laterals were spaced evenly all around through the canopy, then you had good radial branching. So, um, so then, then, uh, then make sure that you understand what a spur is when you're dealing with fruiting trees and shrubs. And spurs are different than, um, than water sprouts and uh, suckers. And the spur is a shortened, and you can see it's in that enlarged circle in, at the top of that, that, that diagram. It's a shorter, sprout that has buds all along the sides and the tip. Those are the flower buds and also the place where the fruit will be formed. So, and then, and then you have water sprouts. Those are, those are sprouts of, of, of stems growing straight up from a horizontal branch. And then, and then suckers are sprouts that go straight out of the ground from the root system. So, um, so water sprouts and suckers are not good. Spurs are. Okay, so here are, this, here are the pruning shears and you wanna have a good quality of, um, of, 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 of handheld pruning shears. My favorite to encourage people to, to strive to get 
are the Falco brands. And um, and I'm like, I, I got my first Falco as a present from my dad when I graduated with my degree in horticulture at the University of Illinois. And um, these are the different styles and, and, and brands that we have. Lopping shears are actually a bypass pruning shear just with long extended handles. So, which is nice, it keeps you off of ladders. You know, if you have to get up on a ladder to do any major pruning, that to me indicates you're better off getting a professional um, arborist to do your pruning for you rather than, you know, rather than getting up on it. Now, now there's a difference between the bypass and anvil pruners. An anvil pruner is on the left in this photo. And there, there's the blade that chops down on a flat metal structure. And these are really reserved and, and, and preferred to be used on dead tissue, dead branches, because you can really cut through a lot of things with it. But when you have that, you have that, um, the, 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 the base, and it's on one side of a live branch, and then the slicer goes through from the other side, it, you get the pressure and you get a lot of damaged cells on, on that branch structure from the flat side of the anvil. So you want two sharp blades going past each other. Now the, the head shears are bypassed, but just a, long, a longer blade. Okay, now you always need to keep your pruning shears sharp. And you can use um, you know, pruning sto you know, stones and or the diamond, you know, the diamond pruning um, it, 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 you know, sharpeners. Um, I like the diamond ones because you can use them both ways. Um, when you're using a, a stone, you need to just use it, you know, use it one direction. But by having sharpened tools, you have healthier cuts that heal faster. And there's, there's a lot to be said about that old saying, keep your edge. And so I like to encourage people to have your sharpening stone with you. And as you're looking at the tree deciding or the shrub deciding where you're gonna be making your cuts, you, you wanna you wanna hold, you know, prune, you know, hone your edge of, you know, and so you have a very, very sharp, 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 sharp as we start doing the pruning. So pruning involves making decisions. So it's based on what you're pruning, why you're pruning it, when you're pruning it, you need to know where to prune it and you need to know how. So I'm gonna go over those really quick. And again, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm gonna, this, the, the why is you wanna remove damaged plant parts. So if they've been, if there was any breakage, you know, in the winter from wind, um, you wanna remove errant growth. So if you've got a branch that's growing out over your sidewalk and it's blocking your path, it's errant growth. You, you know, you're, you're the master of your landscape, you can prune it. Uh, you wanna prune to increase um, stem and foliar density. Um, that's, um, that's really true for blooming shrubs and blooming trees. Uh, you wanna stimulate flowering and fruiting. Again, good for um, you know, blooming shrubs. You can use it to create unusual shapes and forms. Uh, that's Ed Edward Scissorhands was the pro at that. So that's like the topiary. Uh, you want to you, you want to prune it to stimulate new growth. Um, you can rejuvenate prune, especially things like lilacs after they finish blooming, to encourage new growth because woody plants flower better and more on new growth. And I'm going to go into those details. And then you also need to prune to protect people and property. So if you have a broken branch hanging over your neighbor's house, then um, and then you know you need to. Do that. Okay, so now uh, when? Okay, what's really important is to understand when the plant blooms and, and whether the plant blooms on old wood or new wood. And a good examples of plants that bloom on old wood are things like magnolias, lilacs, clint, uh, clint, quince, forsythia, redbud. Those are all early spring blooming things. So if they bloom on old wood, now might not be the best time to prune those unless the exception is damaged wood and diseased wood. You can prune any plant that has damaged wood and diseased wood to remove those parts. But just know that when you're pruning a plant that blooms on old wood, you're also pruning off the buds that will open in the spring. 
Now, new wood plants are like roses. Roses are the classic blooming on new wood. Potentia, Budlia, Rose of Sharon, hydrangeas, most hydrangeas, okay? So, um, so I just put these, gosh, isn't it nice looking at those pictures of the magnolia and the roses? Ooh, when you look outside and everything's brown and brown and brown, okay? It's kind of cool. All right, so now when? Okay, again, plants that produce flowers on old, old wood carry their flower buds on their branches over the winter and should be pruned after they flower. And you need to do the pruning six to eight weeks after they bloom before they start forming their buds for next year. So like a lilac blooms Memorial Day. So you wanna have it, you wanna have it pruned if you need to prune it um, be before the end of July. Now plants that produce flower on new wood or the current season's growth should be pruned before that new growth starts. So uh, like hydrangeas, you can, you know, like any of the, um, any of the uh, paniculata types and um, 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 you know, the, the roses, roses, roses are the classic ones. Okay, and then again, when I've, I've talked about this, that if you're willing to sacrifice flowers for one season, then, you know, when to prune is easy. So, um, so okay. Now, where is, is so important. So I've got these great photos. So the, the images of, these are roses. This is a rose up here. So you can see uh, where a bud is and where a, a, a bud is emerging out of, out of the stem. Then if you cut on the, the, the example of the, the far left is a cut that is too high above that bud. And if you leave that, then that will become dead tissue and it's a, a place for an entry place for disease and roses are so susceptible to disease, fungal diseases, and then insects and stem borers are likely to try to bore into a stem like that one. Now, if you cut too low, you'll see how the angle, you know, cut way lower than that bud. And so it's compromised the cambium on the opposite side of that stem. And then the correct cut at an angle, and the reason you want to do it at an angle is so that you don't have a flat surface for water to, to collect on and sit, especially overnight. So when you have that angle, the, the angle, the water is going to, you know, roll right off. So this is this is that example. Now I've got, you know, the, the drawings and the diagrams. Again, too close, wrong angle, you know, on on this one, too long, and just right is, you know, with the with the green check mark. All right, so now large branch removal is different. And, and, and so you have to be aware of that. And you wanna do a three cut technique. And the first cut is all the way, it, you, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna do an undercut about 12 inches away from where you want the branch to come off the tree. And you just undercut usually a third to a halfway through the branch and then come out away from that with your saw, your pruning saw, and do the second cut and you know, from the top. And as you're sawing down, what will happen is that, that that branch will probably break and snap. And then and then it will link up with the first cut to prevent ripping the bark all the way down the trunk. And the photo that I have right here shows correct cuts and an incorrect cut, where you know, because no undercut was done, that branch tore off. Now then the third cut you wanna make is you wanna get rid of a stump. You never wanna leave a stump. And um, many, many years ago, back when I was in college, it was always um, said to use a flush cut. And then Dr. Shigo, Dr. Alex Shigo did research. And it, this was after I got out of college and he shook up the whole our, our, you know, arboriculture world. And because he discovered the branch collar and the branch collar is tissue that surrounds where a branch is emerging from a trunk. And that is the tissue that will heal over the wound of, of, of a pruning cut. And so you wanna do a, that third cut where it matches the angle of the, of the branch collar swelling area. And I'm gonna show you another diagram. And on some trees, it's easy to see the branch collar, like this one. You can see that swelling 
and then you're just going to cut right along the edge of that branch collar. And usually it, it, it's a 90 degree angle from where the, the branch attaches to the trunk. And then here's another. This is Dr. Shigo's research. research. And you can see on the left side was a flush cut where the branch was cut just flush to where um, the, the bark on the trunk was. And what it did was it removed the, um, the, the branch collar. And so there was no healing tissue to grow, you know, to grow over. And you can see the entry point for the fungal decay organisms and how the wood was rotting in along where that branch would, would, would have been, was originally emerged. Now the proper cut on the other side, you can see where the branch collar tissues are still there and they're growing up and healing and growing up over the, uh, the wound. And when you do a proper scar, or a proper cut, you get a scar like this. We call it a kiss cut. And you can see where all of that um, branch collar tissue was growing up over and it grows in towards the center. And within this cut or this pruning was probably done um, three years earlier on this tree. And in five years, that healing tissue will grow together. And then the, 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 the trunk will just keep growing and growing. And you oftentimes won't even be able to tell where that cut is. Now you're gonna, you're gonna curse me because as you're sitting in traffic going forward and waiting for the light to change, you'll be looking at trees and you'll see proper cuts and you'll see improper cuts. If you cut too close to the top and the bottom, then the healing looks like a cat eye. So it's pointed, you know, it's pointed at the top and the bottom, and then the tissue grows in. And the, the thing that's bad about that is that can lead to frost cracking. So, so you wanna do this right now. This is old school, old school, old school, tree paints and sealants. sealants. Uh, we don't sell them here anymore. It's best not to use them. Research proves that, and I should have a big red X on this picture because I don't want people to think that I'm, I'm promoting that you should be using this. But um, what the research shows that you trap more fungus and more bacteria underneath the paint and the sealers than if you just let it you know, air heal. And, and trees and shrubs, woody plants, have wonderful healing techniques. As soon as it realizes it has a wound, it puts it builds up callus tissue underneath where the wound was, and then that prevents any organisms from getting through into the heartwood. And all woody plants do that on their own. It's amazing. Okay, so now this is the rule of three pruning for a shrub. And so you know, so you know, any any of the shrubs that you want to do a rejuvenation, you 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 know, if you you kind of assess it from a distance. You know, I kind of look at it from a distance. And then I remove any broken or diseased branches. And you can see that in, in, in diagram number two. Then diagram number three, you wanna remove a third of the oldest, <clears throat> thickest stems, because by doing that, you're getting rid of old wood and you're gonna encourage new wood to form. So this is wonderful for things like viburnums, um, um, burning bush, um, lilacs, anything that, you know, that, that blooms like that. And then you can see the finished, the finished look. Then you also wanna remove a third of the length of all the branches. So that's the rule of three for pruning. And the reason there, that exists is you don't wanna upset the ratio of the top growth to the root growth by more than a third. If you do that, you put the plant into shock. So, so, so always remember that rule of three. And then this is just a different diagram to show you how you've got those thick, thick branches, you cut those out. I usually like to tell people to cut out the thickest branches first. No, no, excuse me. I tell people to come in, take the third of the height down. And you're not just gonna do a straight cut across the top of the shrub. You're gonna take a third of the length of every one of those branches from the ends. So you're gonna end up having a, you know, a rounded shape rather than just a, a cut off straight. And then, then after that, Come in and remove a third of the oldest branches. Now it is possible that you could remove one of the biggest oldest branch you know, clusters, and then a whole third of the of the shrub is removed. If that happens, stop right there, walk away, 
let it grow that 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 new, that year, and then you can do that rule of three three years in a row if you want to really resize an overgrown shrub. Okay. Now we're moving on, and um, this is the time to enjoy the seeds uh, that we have the, the seeds for the vegetable gardens. Excuse me. I'm going to get a, a sip of coffee in the, with this topic change. I love my Yeti. Okay, so we carry the Renee's garden seeds, uh, the botanical interest seeds, Seed Savers Exchange, and Hudson Valley. And these are all companies that are sold um, just they just, they just sell to independent retail stores. So you're not gonna see these in the big box stores. So there's some really wonderful varieties. And I love to point out that Renee has um, two side kind of, um, 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 not structures, holders um, of her seeds that are varieties that are designed for container gardening and or because of their smaller structure, or smaller size and smaller habit, they're good in raised beds where you have a smaller garden. So whenever you see um, um, you know, a container like a bowl or a pot um, on, her, on her packaging, you know that's a good, a good one for a container garden or for a smaller, a smaller, gar a smaller garden like a raised bed. Um, so, oh, I, I, I was gonna, I, I didn't put a photo of this. One thing you wanna always be aware of is the back of the seed packets have so much wonderful information on them. They tell you the planting depth that you should be planting. They'll tell you the planting time. They tell you the size, the mature size of the plant, how tall it is. That's important. So you can stage it in the garden. So you have your taller plants on the north side of the garden and your shorter ones on the south side because the, the sun is in the south sky in the growing season. So you don't want to block the sun for the majority of your, you know, of your plants. So the tallest ones go to the north and the shortest ones go to the south. Um, and then the other really important thing is it tells you days to harvest. So, so look for the varieties and, and, and do a, a, a good mixed selection of the different bloom times so that, especially tomatoes, I like to do an early, early tomato, a mid-season tomato and a late, a late, a late tomato tomato. So I, I have a harvest all, you know, all through the whole, the whole season. So, and, you know, save those seed packets because there's just such wonderful information. Botanical interest has an excellent seed packet as well. Okay. Now we all have the seed starting products. Um, you've got the, we have the, the Jippy brand, which is peat pot. They're made from peat, but we also are carrying the core based uh, products. And this is plant best, which is, um, you know, we have the pots, and then we also have the plugs, which are fun because you water them, they puff up, they have a hole in the center where you can put your seeds. And then the mesh that is it, it, that forms the, the plug, uh, the roots will grow through them. So you can just take that whole plug and either plant it out in the garden and or plant it in a, a larger pot and let, and let your seed, you know, your seedling grow on until it's time to plant it outside. Now, one thing that's really important, always make sure that you know about the frost-free date. And that's here May 15th in the Chicagoland area. And you have the, the cool season crops like you know, lettuces, spinach, um, kales, um, peas. Um, those are crops that are safe to plant, um, usually the end of, of March, the first or second week in April, and, and before, before the danger of frost has passed they'll be fine. And you usually harvest those before, now let's go forward here. You harvest those before then, and then in this same, this is a great diagram that Renee's garden has. You can find this on her webpage. I also have it here at Chalet at the diagnostic desk, if you'd like a copy of this. And, um, and these are the examples of the peas she's showing at, on a four foot by a six foot style um, size raised bed. And you do your carrots and radishes together because you harvest your radishes before and then the carrots fill in. Beets, baby spinach, a Renee's stir fry mix. Um, mescaline is the wonderful, um, um, very tart, um, fresh greens for salads. And then 
parsley and cilantro. Excellent for that. Then once you've done the harvest of this, then you're gonna go to your warm season crops and I'm gonna come to that at another garden coach. But an example of warm season crops are tomatoes, peppers, squashes, corn, um, those, those are the classics, those are the classics. And you don't wanna put those into the ground. So don't start those seeds too early because if you start tomatoes this time of year, you're gonna end up with these very skinny stretched seedlings because they're not gonna get enough sunlight. They're not gonna get as intense a sunlight as they need. Um, and so hold off on starting those until, you know, until, in, until like mid April so that you're gonna have good healthy seedlings to put out into your garden. Now, um, this is, um, it's time to fertilize your houseplants right now uh, because the days are getting longer and longer, the light's getting brighter and brighter. This is my favorite one to encourage people to use. It's called the Dynagro Grow Liquid Plant Food. It's a 795, so you have that high phosphorus, um, for root development and also flowering if you have a plant that flowers. But what makes this better than all of the other liquids, you know, liquid fertilizers that are out there is it has 11 micronutrients. And I enlarged the, the, the um, label on the back so you could just see how many you've got the calcium, magnesium, sulfur, boron, chlorine, cobalt, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, sodium, and zinc. And they work synergistically with these numbers and your, your plants, especially your house plants, are gonna be just phenomenal. Now, this I'm gonna talk about, we're seeing tons, I'm seeing tons and tons of problems with house plants, people coming in. Lots of this on fiddle leaf figs that showing the, when these leaves were forming, these are probably just starting to form at the end of December, early January. And then, you know, we were so, everyone was so busy that time of year that it's easy to overlook the watering chores. And so when those leaflets, those leaflets were in bud and it got a little too dry, you can see how the side that's, that's, that's contorted on these photos was the, the side that's on the outside of the bud and it dried up. And then the, the, the tissue that's on the inside went ahead and opened up and, and, and you don't have the contorted edge. But people are worried that those are insects doing that, that they think something's eating their leaf. No, that's just from fluctuating water and low humidity. So as, as our days you know, are getting longer and brighter, these plants are, are recovering and people are being more aware and they've, we have more time to do the watering. So now when you have an improper watering technique, that usually means watering too frequently and not enough. And, and because people are afraid of overwatering, so they water every other day, that's improper. You, what you wanna do is you wanna water, especially these house plants, you wanna water them once a week, take the pot out of its display pot, take it to the sink, water, let the water drain, water again and let the water drain, and then use your fertilizer. Do that once a week. Now, if a plant does not have drainage, a lot of times people, and with this new houseplant craze, there's a lot of bad information out there. And people find these gorgeous decorative pots that are considered holding pots for indoors. Um, and, and we call that, the French call it the cash pole, but it doesn't have drainage. And people are potting directly into those instead of leaving the houseplant in its nursery pot and then watering appropriately. And then, and then also uh, using the fertilizer, they pot directly into a pot without drainage thinking they can put two or three inches of gravel in the bottom and thinking, thinking that's adequate drainage and it's not. That's, that's actually an 18 month death sentence for the plant. And the reason being is our water is highly mineralized and the plant uses H2O and then the H2O evaporates out of the soil and all those minerals stay in. So if you can't water and let it drain out and water and let it drain out, those minerals build up and then they combine indiscriminately to form salts. And then you get these, this yellowing of the foliage. Or when you have too much water that builds up in the bottom, that's the perfect environment for the water molds like, um, like rhizoctonia and pythium. And those are what causes the, the roots to rot. And when you have root rot, then you get these yellowing lower leaves. So, and, and or, or you can get brown tips on the leaves. And this is what root rot looks like. 
you know, when you have healthy roots, they're white, they're firm. This is an example of, well, you can see this root, this plant has root rot and it has two different problems. It has the brown areas that, you know, that are, are brown and mushy, that's pythium. And then rhizoctonia is the black, the black and dry. So, so this, this plant can recover, you know, by changing, changing the potting mix and, and, and repotting it in a pot with drainage and using a good, a, a good rejuvenative um, fertilizer like that Dynagro. Now it is still time to repot re re house plants. This is just a photo. And then um, I, 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 we posted um, uh, a, a YouTube video of me showing you how to repot and in two different techniques where if you want the plant to get larger, how you repot in a larger pot. And then if you want to just you know, rejuvenate the plant, but keep it in the same size pot because it fits in at this gorgeous you know, Chinese decorated cash po that you have. It, you know, and so that one, you, you're gonna cut two inches off the bottom of the root ball and then set it back up and an inch off of um, all four sides and then put fresh mix in the bottom of the same pot, fresh potting mix, because roots grow down and out never up. So you never want to put potting mix on top of the root ball. You want that root ball to be the same. Now, unless, unless, let me do an, a, one little exception. If there's been a lot of erosion and you have, ex, you, you have exposed roots at the top, you can get by putting as little as an inch on top of the root ball just to cover up those exposed roots, okay? But when you get a chance, I'm not gonna go to this YouTube video, but this is the address for it. You can cut, you can cut and paste this off of the handout or take a photo if you have your if your phone with you right now take a photo of this and then um you can you know cut and paste and or go right to that um that uh, that youtube video it's it's a pretty good video i'm pretty proud of it okay we have been seeing tons of fungus gnat and fungus gnat is a pest when you when plants go outside for the summer these gnats fly around they lay eggs on the soil. The eggs can stay dormant for five years. And then when you bring the plant back in the house, then, um, and, and then what happens is we usually start watering more or watering more heavily in the winter time because the humidity gets so low in our houses, our plants are transpiring um, more frequently and the soil stays moist a little longer than it normally would. And that stimulates the eggs hatching. And so when those eggs hatch, the larvae feed on fungus that occurs naturally on the organic matter of the potting mix, excuse me. <coughs> and then they pupate and emerge as the adult. And it looks like fruit flies flying around your kitchen or <coughs> your den. And the, they're not, they don't do anything. They don't cause any problems except mate and lay more eggs. They usually only live about, seven to 10 days <coughs> and then they're gone. But if you have a heavy population, they're terrible. And then we've had some problems with some of the um, um, less expensive brands of um, potting mix that have had the fungus net larva, their, their eggs in it. So if you have that, what you wanna do is come and get a systemic insecticide, the systemic houseplant insecticide from uh, Bonide. You sprinkle that over the surface of the soil at two and a half tablespoons, tablespoons, not teaspoon, at a, for a six inch pot diameter, water through it. You know, you're gonna pour the water through those granules. It's gonna dissolve the insecticide, take it down the cell and kill the fungus gnat on contact. And it lasts 30 days. So if you're dealing with the fungus gnat problem, treat all of your pots you know, once every 30 days and you'll get rid of it. And, and it, it really is effective. Now, if you have edible plants that are, you're having problems with, there's a great product called Mosquito Bits. And it's from a, com a company called um, Summit, S-U-M-M-I-T. And we have it in two different packages and they're cork um, particles that are treated with Bt bacteria. And that's a bacteria that only affects mosquito larva and fungus gnat larva, and it kills them. So you sprinkle that over, water it in, and it stays in 
the, the soil for 30 days. So, um, so there's great controls. Now, the other thing we're seeing is two-spotted spider mite. Two-spotted spider mite, the, the eggs can stay dormant for five years. And what triggers them to, to hatch is when it gets hot and dry. For an insect, hot and dry is 72 degrees, our room temperature, and dry is when our humidity goes down to um, a single digit or like below 10%. <laughs> I am so sorry. This is what spider mite looks like. When you bring a sample in and I put it under my microscope, you can see the two spots on the adult. All those little globes <coughs> are the eggs. When you look at it with the naked eye, you'll kind of, you'll see something. This is a real heavy infestation. You'll see almost look like little white sand particles. Usually you can't see the, uh, the adults unless you use a magnifying glass or a, a microscope. When there's damage, you see the yellow stippling on the upper surface of the leaf. These insects um, have a, 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 a needle mouth part. They stick it in, suck a section dry, it turns yellow, and then that, you get that stippling. And then the bottom photo over here on the right you can see the webbing. And people think it's gonna look like a, a big spider web, like a garden spider web. It's not, it's just this fine netting. Usually you see it when the plants are backlit, okay? So here we go. Then there's mealybugs. We've seen a lot of mealybugs this, this, this winter too. I've seen a lot of mealybugs coming in. They're white and then they form this white cottony mass. They usually collect at the axles of the leaf where a leaf and you know, the stem of the leaf attaches to, you know, to, to the main stem of the plant or the trunk. And, um, you know, but they're kind of fuzzy when they crawl out and they have these long tails. So, you know, again, the, the, um, the control is the systemic. This is scale, scale. A lot of our woody plants get scale and, um, and woody house plants. And you, 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 what you notice is the honeydew. And honeydew is the excrement that they, they, they're sucking the juices of the plant. And what they're trying to get is uh, not the sugar. They want to get the, uh, the enzymes from the plant. And, um, and but the, in, by sucking that much juice, they're getting a lot of sugar too. And so their excrement is very sticky. It's very, it's, you know, it's, it's, we call it, we politely call it honeydew. So use the sign that you have scale You'll, you'll, you'll have sticky leaves, you'll have stickiness on the table that the plant's sitting on or on the carpet, you know, where the plant's sitting. So, you know, so again, the systemics work beautifully for scale. The scale has a protective covering on it. So some of the contact insecticides don't work very well on them. This is my favorite to uh, encourage people to get because this is the three in one insect disease and mite control. Now you're not, they don't recommend spraying it indoors but when we get a warmer day or you can take the plant out to the garage, spray it. And what's great about it, this is a translaminar systemic, which means, which means you would spray it on one surface of the leaf, it's absorbed in the leaf and pulled through to the other side. So you don't have to shellac the plant, just a few drops on, every, on, on it. And it takes care of all these diseases, anthracnose, black spot, leaf spot, powdery mildew, rust and scab. And then all, all of the insects I was talking about, any of the sucking insects, any of the leaf feeding insects like caterpillars, not that we have that problem in the house, and then also spider mites. So this is my favorite. There's also one from BioAdvance called Rose and Flower. It doesn't have the mite control, but it is cleared for use indoors. And it, it looks just like this bottle and it's just called Rose and Flower. Now, shifting gears again to the, pe the, the pests out in our garden. And people go, well, why are you talking about this now? All right, plant speed is the absolute best to use, period. And it's a blood-based product. It's made from bovine blood and porcine blood, and it's sterilized. And you wanna start with the liquid, and, you know, if, if, if the insects are insects, the animals, deer and rabbits are eating the plants and they have been and they are. And the reason I made sure I put this in is in my garden, I was walking in my garden just like two nights ago, looking at some repairs. I had, you know, those 50 mile an hour winds, 
my um, downspout blew off. One of my downspouts blew off my my two story house. So I had to have somebody come and you know and, and reattach it. So I got home from work. I was walking around the yard. Oh my gosh, I chased five different rabbits out from underneath my shrubs. So I was like, oh man. So I need to get out and spray all my bulbs that are just coming up to make sure that those rabbits don't use that as it, you know as their 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 meals. So this is excellent. We have this back in stock now. And this was an example uh, of um, someone came in just a couple uh, weeks ago and, and showed me the, the damage. The, the, the rabbit just rode the snow up and then chewed the bark. And then as the, the, the snow melted back down, you can see the pellets or the droppings and that gave away who 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 the culprit was. So this poor this poor tree may not make it. We need to see how deep it went and and whether it, it looks like it girdled it all around. But anyway, this is public enemy number one. And these are examples. They eat all the bottom of the arborvitae. You know, they ate they ate this. You know, all the bark off of this was um, a service berry, and then uh, and then roses. They just ruin roses. They absolutely ruin roses. So. So I, I'm, I'm not a fan. I am not a fan of rabbits at all. Okay. And then this was just showing what happens from, you know, from <clears throat> winter damage. So there's still time to spray with wilt proof. You know, if you want to protect plants that if they're just starting to um, put out new growth and then we have a cold snap, you know, spray it with wilt proof. You can do one more application of wilt proof to really protect, protect those plants. And then this is a pine. Uh, derived resin that seals the stomates and helps coat the tissues so it, they don't they don't um, the liquid doesn't get uh, evaporated or frozen out of it. Now we had a lot of new house plants here. We still have them, so if you still need house plants, come in and get new house plants. And uh, then and then if you have oh, I'm looking at my time. Oh, it's ten minutes till, so I'll have time for questions and answers. Um, always know that you can send the samples in or, um, or photos to me. This is an old, old picture of me. Look at, look at our old uniform, isn't that fun? And then, um, and, oh, and, and I, look about, I look about 20 pounds lighter um, with my goggles and my magnifying glass. But um, I love my microscope. I absolutely love my microscope. And you know, many of you might have seen it. And what's wonderful about it is um, I have a camera mounted on it so that whatever I'm looking at, you can see on the screen when you bring a sample in. So this is just a, 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 a great, a great close-up of powdery mildew. And I'm, we're seeing a little bit of that on plants that are growing in uh, greenhouses and or growing in sunrooms uh, because we're watering more. Rosemary always gets, always gets powdery mildew this time of year. So you can spray, um, you can spray um, like um, um, any of the, um, the earth friendly natural fungicides, copper spray is excellent to spray on uh, any, any fungal things on edibles like rosemary. And it, it, it stops it just like that. And then, oh, there we go. And you can, I, I had to show you the, the sample of the, it is big, 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 but you put it under the microscope and you see all the details. And then, thank you, thank you. Um, here's to spring coming um, and I'm gonna, Turn, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and then go to the questions and answers. Oh, here we go. All right, Q&A. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. Now, Maureen Gallagher asked right at the beginning of the lecture at 10.06, how tall do they get? So that was probably about the hellebores. So hellebores will get, and they usually are 24 to 30 inches tall. And then there's some, there's some dwarf ones that are only about 12. So that, you know, that, was, that was 24, 24 to 30 inches. Okay, and here we go, that one is done. Okay, Arthur Mollenhauer, Mollenhauer, I'm not, great job, two questions on viburnums. You planted new five gallon plants last fall. Rabbits did a lot of damage. Oh, I'm so sorry. Over the winter, we fenced them to save them. When is it safe to remove the protective fencing? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I would spray with, I would spray with um, the, the plant skied and then, and then wait 
you know, wait until you're starting to see the new growth um, coming out. And then, um, oh boy, that, this is a good one. What happens is they get used to eating something and go back to the same plants. And a lot of times you'll see the rabbits going back, you may have five plants and they just keep going back to two in the front or one in the front, one in the back. So be, be aware of that. Spray with, spray with the, the plant skeet first. Then you can also use a granular and I use the granular. I have such a bad problem with rabbits in my garden. I'll use the granular all around the perimeter of my garden bed, but I've sprayed the plants in the middle of the bed. And then when they come hopping through, and this was a great example of how great plant, plant skin works. Um, I had, was coming home from work one evening and I pulled up in the driveway and here were two rabbits mating in the front, the front yard. And oh, I was like, no, 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 no more, no more. I jumped out of my car and started chasing them across the yard. And instead of running straight across my garden, that would be the straight path out, they went around the garden because I had been using plant skin forever on it. And I, I was like, oh my God, that's wonderful. So, uh, but then of course my husband drove up seeing me chasing rabbits out of the yard. And he goes, Jen, you better stop doing that. The neighbors are going to start talking about you. So, so anyway, so now next question two, we have a mature viburnum hedge we need to resize. Uh, is it correct to prune 33% after spring flowering? You got it, Arthur. That's what you got it. You got it. You got it. Absolutely. So you're going to take, take a third of the height and then come in and take a third of the oldest, thickest branches out. And then what that will do is that will rejuvenate, new wood will form and grow up through the center of the plant and you'll have a whole new plant. You'll have a whole new hedge, a whole new hedge. Excellent, 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 excellent question. Okay, then. Now this is, oh, Dora, hi, Dora. Um, is it correct that you fertilize the spring bulbs three times a year? Oh, three times is interesting. Um, I just think twice is, is good. So I like to prune them, or I like to prune them. I like to fertilize them. Uh, they're heavy, heavy feeders. Uh, I just automatically fertilize when they're coming up every spring. And I put, I put the Dr. Earth bulb food around the base. And you know, if you have a, a planting area, it's one cup every 10 square feet. So five by two. If you're just doing bouquets and bunches of bulbs coming up, it's just a quarter of, you know, quarter of a cup. Actually, it, it, yeah, it's a, an eighth to a quarter of a cup. Sprinkle it all just around on top of the ground and just leave it. It lasts for 60 days. And then do it again in the fall. I like to plant grape hyacinth in areas where my bulbs are all planted because they send their foliage up every fall. And then I know where all my bulbs are because they're, they're dormant in the fall, but I know where they are so I can put the fertilizer down. So two times a year, Dora, not, not three times. Okay, here we go. And here's another, Dora. Uh, oh, first at fall planting, uh, springtime when new green shoots appear and immediately after planting, thank you. You know what, Dora, the, the two and three could be one time, especially if you're using um, the Dr. Earth bulb food that lasts 60 days. But you know, you know, first at fall planting, that's you want to do it at fall planting and on top of the soil after you planted, but then always do a fall fertilization where where you know that they are. So I used to mark, I used to, my first husband was a golfer. And that's why he was my first husband. <laughs> no, that's why I got rid of him. But um, but uh, I used to use his golf tees to mark where my um, my bulbs are planted. So I would know where to fertilize. Well, the squirrels started, you know, like picking them and moving them around. And, and I, I accused my husband of doing that, but or my first husband. Anyway, anyway, that, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be talking like that. Pardon me. Okay. Is it a good time to transplant sh to shrub roses like rainbow or fairy rose plant? Uh, yes. This, as soon as the ground thaws, it is, a, it's a, you know, a good time to plant, uh, to transplant your roses, you know, and you want to get them in the ground before that new growth starts. Okay, good one. All right, and here's done. And then I answered that one. Okay, and now Marianne, I can only get one page of your handout. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, Marianne. Um, on, on another Q&A or just send it to Jennifer B 
at J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-B at chalenursery.com. Just send me an email. And then I'll have your email address and I'll just I'll just return and send the, the handout to you that way. I'm so sorry, only one page came out. I'll have I'll have our marketing people check that. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, now uh, Maureen, sorry, I was asking the height of hellebores. Oh, I figured that out. Cool. Uh, all right. Here we go. And anonymous attendee. I love the anonymous. Rabbits chewed my azaleas almost to a stub this winter. Oh, I'm so sorry. Boy, I hate rabbits. I need to share my grandfather's pus and pepper stew recipe, don't I? He used to harvest rabbits from his farm at harvest. They would hunt rabbits and drive them over to the farmer's market. Uh, they would have a whole flatbed of, of rabbits and take them over to the farmer's market in Evansville, Indiana, at, you know, at every, every, every spring. You know, so and and every, every, every you know and and make a lot of money from it. Okay, all right. Now I need to, I need to get some plants to keep them from doing more damage. But is is it too soon to treat with a holly tone to try to give them a fighting chance to survive? Well, you know what? It is a little early to use um, holly tone. I would wait just because you know we're still going to be getting a lot of precipitation, and with the ground partially frozen. Um, you could go, it could wash away. Holly tone lasts 30 days. So I would wait until um, the last week of March and then do and then do the application. Okay, great question. All right, and then, okay, done. And then Michelle, can I sow columbine seeds outside? When and how? Um, you can, but like we have prairie future seeds that have columbine seeds. You probably collected columbine seeds, you know, from your own garden, but they needed they needed to be um, um, cold treated, and and and, and um, it's called vernalize, vernalize or vernalization. So if if the seeds you just have the seeds, the best thing to do is to put them in a baggie with moist sand. I, I put like two cups of sand in a baggie and moisten it, and then mix the seeds in with it. Put it in the refrigerator for eight weeks, two months. And then after that, you can sprinkle that out. The, the sand holds the seeds in place and they'll germinate as the soil temperatures warm up in the spring. But they do need to be, they do need to have that cold treatment. That's why when the seeds fell from the plant last year, they didn't, they didn't start growing automatically. They had to go through a winter so that the cold treatment could break the hormone that prevents them from germinating. It, it gets broken down in the cold. And so if you've just been keeping these seeds inside all winter, they need to be vernalized. Okay. Great questions. Great questions. All right. Now this is Joan. How to prune Annabelle hydrangeas uh, if I want the stems to be harder. Okay. Uh, so Annabelle's, what you do is prune them now. You can prune them in March down to um, 12 inches to 18 inches from the ground. And then you'll get new shoots coming from those, but then you'll also get new shoots coming from the ground. Okay, and these were the hardy, and, and, you know, uh, uh, hydrangeas that we white flowering that we the only kind we could enjoy in our gardens for many many years. Then after they the new growth starts, <clears throat> and they're about two and a half to three feet tall in May, so like May 15, come in, prune them down a third, and then that slows them down, causes them to branch makes that basal stem get thicker and, and harder. And so they tend to stand up better. They don't flop as much. Great question. Good, good question. Okay, here we go. Capture live, done. Okay, now three questions and a comment. Okay, do Narcissus bulbs normally survive as long as your Arkansas bulbs? Yes, um, the Narcissus, um, they, if, as long as you keep fertilizing them, they're heavy, heavy feeders and people don't realize that. So as long as you fertilize them in the spring after they finish flowering and or just when the stems start coming up, either one or the other, um, and that gives them the building blocks and then they need to have good sun so they can recharge the bulb and make them build the bulb ball back up and then do that in the spring and during the fall, they just keep coming back and coming back and coming back. And a lot of times we'll say you have to you know dig them up and divide them and transplant them as long as you give them that fertilizer. They just kind of keep recycling and recycling, and recycling, and, and it's, it's really good. It, it, of course, it doesn't hurt if you want to divide them and spread them out, but um, 
but it, it, the ones down in at my home in Arkansas, I, I haven't, I've just, I've just, just, we just keep fertilizing them and they just keep coming back and it's, and then they're so early down there. It's just so nice. It makes me envious that my sisters are down there and I'm up here. But anyway, okay, last warm Saturday, I cut two containers of tall grass down to two inches. Good job, bravo. Okay, was that premature or too drastic? No, 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 no. It is perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, I, well, I regret cutting the grass. Not at all. You did it perfect. You did it absolutely perfect, absolutely perfect. Okay, well, the bottom of the arbor vitaes grow back after I've used on them. No, I'm so sorry, they will not. So if you've got an arbor vitae hedge where the rabbits have done that damage to it, just plan to, to plant up in front and you can plant other low, low growing shrubs or also, you know, um, like um, good, good shade loving perennials um, are great. And they'll mask, they'll mask those leggy, those leggy bare stems. And it's just a shame that rabbits do that, isn't it? Okay, so now your pear espalier photo was beautiful. Oh, nice comment. I like it. A webinar on espaliers would be interesting. Oh, thank you. Okay, I suspect it's difficult, however, but it would be fun to hear how it's done. Okay, thanks for the suggestion. I, I'll keep that. I'll keep that in mind, and I'll, I'll I'll present that to our marketing people to see if they want to do that. I think that's a cool idea. Thank you so much. Okay, here we go, and I'm done. And then this is for Shelly. Squirrels have been chewing on my beauty berries once they are at the berry stage. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, on the beauty berries, use plant skeed. Plant skeed would keep would keep the squirrels off of it. And now understand that because it's blood based, you know you want to spray on a day where it's you know nice and non-raining. And and then it is it is going to be darkened from the color of the dried you know the the the, the blood, but it dries to a clear. So 24 hours later, it'll be completely clear and, and the squirrels won't touch them. So, so that, that I'm so sorry that happened, but yeah, use the plant skeet, it's excellent. Okay, um, and then here's um, PB. Can plant skeet be used on frozen ground? Um, yeah, it can. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm curious if you have diggers, if you have somebody digging. Um, but yeah, plant skid can be used on frozen ground. But if you want to protect plants that are being eaten and chewed, spray it directly on the plant. All right. Yeah, great, great question. All right. And then Marianne will do. Cool. Okay. Um, oh, Luann, hi. Uh, what should I be doing with my endless summer hydrangeas now? Um, I have not cut them back. Okay. For endless summer, <clears throat> what happens is um, they, they, were, they were introduced as the end-all be-all for hydrangeas because they were supposed, supposedly would flower on new wood and old wood. But unfortunately, we, we, we don't get snow cover like they do up in Minnesota where, you know, where they were discovered. And so, so we, I tell, we tell people, wait until the new growth starts, you know, when the soil warms up and we have warm temperatures, wait till the new growth starts. I would give them a good um, application of a good fertilizer like the Dr. Earth Bud and Bloom Booster, and it lasts 60 days. So April 15, you know, put a cup down around the base. It's a cup for every 10 square feet. And I think in terms of a, of, of a, a hydrangea being in a three by three area, that's nine square feet. Then wait till you see the new growth. And when the new growth starts coming out of the, you know, the, the, the old season wood, last season's wood, then you'll prune any of dead wood down to just above where the, the, the buds are, are emerging. And then, and then the new shoots that are coming from the ground, and you'll get quite a few that come from the ground as well. Um, Mid-May, you wanna come in and prune the tips and you're cutting the terminals and encouraging laterals. And the laterals bloom heavier than the terminals do. So you'll get much better bloom by doing those, those, those two tricks, okay? Um, great question. Great question. All right. Now, Anna Westine, when can I prune wisteria? It grows all over my front yard. Um, the wisteria, you, you'll, you'll prune that, prune that and prune back all of the long, the long uh, um, growth that just had foliage last summer and then prune it back to the, you know, to the main branches. And then that will encourage the, the flowering, the flowering branches to grow. Great question. Okay, here we 
ago. And then this is Janet. And uh, is it the best time, is it best time to cut back perennials that have been left up for winter interest? Yes, yes, this is this is the good time to, you know, to prune those, to prune, to prune those back. Excellent. Anytime we have a nice warm day where the snow is melted, get out and, and tidy those up. And um, you know, and, you know, excellent. So things like things like um, sometimes I, I can leave my um, my irises up, you know that you know that, and sometimes they haven't flopped over. So and things like oh, things like the sedum, you know, that the autumn joy sedum. I leave the flowering spike up; it's dried. I still bees. A lot of times I'll leave my spiky. I, I still be as it blooms up because you know the, it, it has that wonderful mahogany brown color. Prune those all off. Good, 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 good questions. Good questions. Okay, my, uh, Michelle Thomas, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, let me see, I've gone, it's, it's nine after 11. Um, thank, th thanks for the compliment, Michelle. Th thank you. Uh, Marie Hetland, I have sage and bergamot that I left for winter interest and for wildlife them back now or a bit later. I, I would I would wait a little bit later. I, I would wait and do that do that in April. You know, do that in April. Yeah. You don't have to you don't have to print it away now. Um, you know it you know do 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 it in April. Okay. Uh, Trisha, how should I clean up blue fescue grasses? They were newly planted last year. Uh, so they're on a smaller side. It trimmed a lot down last Saturday, but wonder if I should have and do the rest of them, you know, with this over an inch. Um, you know, uh, Tricia, if they've actually browned, go ahead and prune them down to like two inches from, you know, from, you know, from, from the ground, because you're getting rid of that old foliage. If they haven't browned out, then you can leave them, but then the new foliage is going to grow up through them. But so if you prune some, I would just prune all of them. And then, you know, and then, you know, put a good fertilizer down um, to help give them that building block. Um, if, since they were just newly planted last year, you might want to use a uh, root and grow, the liquid root and grow transplanting solution. It's a 4103 nutrient with the rooting hormone. And you know, help them get rooted, and then that'll help push out a lot of a lot of new growth. Very good, very good. And then I got a nice compliment. Thank you, um, PB. Uh, thank you. You're the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. It, it's so nice to be back in, back in the saddle again with you all. Oh, and here's here's. Okay, should Star of Bethlehem be removed? That is, that's a chat. Boy, Linda, oh, we have, oh, wait a minute. Hold on, chat, I didn't do the chat right. Oh, I just saw it and that was it. Well, the Star of Bethlehem, um, yes, I, I remove it from my garden. I, it is just, a, it, it's a weed, it'll grow everywhere. And then it, it's so late to bloom and it blooms for maybe three days. So yeah, I would get rid of Star of Bethlehem. And back when I was a novice gardener at my house, I, I, I had some in the yard and I thought, ooh, I'm gonna save these. And I moved them all over my garden. Oh man, boy, what, you know, what you learn by mistakes. So, so, um, so, so anyway, so, okay, okay. Oh, and here's another one. Oh, hi, Susan. Thank you very much. Wonderful information. Thank you from Susan. Thank you. Um, everybody, you're the best. And um, I'll see you again in two weeks for Garden Coach with all kinds of new things. Oh, here's one more question. Uh, Luann, is there any way to get rid of snow on the mountain? Mm, um, well, yes, there is. Yes, there is. You know, there's, um, now, are you talking about snow on the mountain? Um, there's several common names that there's the, there's that one common name for several different you know different plants and um so I, I need to Luann I'll get back to you I, I have your email address I'll get back to you I'm gonna check um just to make sure or if you want to email me with um like a photo of it or if you know if you know which of the snow on the mountains it is I, I can give you a better I can give you a better and and is the snow on the mountain in um in the lawn or in a bed, a, 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 you know, a, a flower bed. So I'll, I'll um, send me an email, jenniferb at shallynursery.com, okay? And then I have a raised hand. This was a wonderful session. Thank you for the help. Oh, thank you. Excellent, excellent. And then I have two more chats. Okay. Oh, that was a Q and A. 
Yeah, Luann, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, get, I'll get back to you on that, on the snow on the mountain. All right, here's done. And then I think I, think I got, I, I answered all the chats and um, my chat's not coming up. Isn't that silly? Oh, it is coming up. I hit it with this, hold on. Okay, Susan, thank you so much. Wonderful information. And then from Tricia, uh, this is a wonderful session. Thank you for the help. Oh, thank you all. Uh, all right, you know what? I've gone almost a quarter of an hour after uh, when we should, but that's I, I do that to answer all the questions. And we have 35 attendees. And um, thank you so much, everybody. This was This was fantastic. And you all are still with me. Thank you so much. Um, I'd love to see you in the store to take advantage of the wonderful um, Step Into Spring 20% off for all the Shelley Rewards members. All right, you all take care. Thank you, thank you for joining me. Ah. <laughs>